All right, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for September 18th, 2023. This is the time of week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. You might ask, what is CircuitPython? It's a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to sp support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. US, US Eastern Time, 11 a.m. US Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, which we post weekly, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. Uh, the final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the meeting that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 45 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord, and we pin that message to that channel. So check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc. So you can add your notes for the next week. If you'd like to participate but cannot attend, feel free to leave hub reports and status updates in the document for us to read out loud during the meeting. So the meeting is held in five parts, community news, the state of CircuitPython, libraries and Blinka, hub reports, status updates, and in the weeds. And I'll explain each of these as we get to them. And with that, we'll now start um, with community news. I'll take a timestamp. So these um, items come from the uh, Python or Microcontrollers weekly newsletter. I'll tell you about that more in a minute. Um, so first item is the IEEE Spectrum Survey of Top Programming Languages for 2023. There was a ranking of this. Python and Java are on top, with Python the leader by a considerable margin. Python has become the jack-of-all-trades language and the master of some, such as AI, where powerful and extensive libraries make it ubiquitous. And although Moore's law is winding down for high-end computing, low-end microcontrollers are still benefiting from performance gains, which means there's now enough computing power available on a US 70 cent CPU to make Python a contender, contender in embedded development. So this is great. They're basically saying that CircuitPython and MicroPython, they mentioned them in the first paragraph of the description, which is fantastic. Um, or maybe it's not the first paragraph, but it's prominent. OK, uh, next item we'll talk about is uh, that CircuitPython 8.2.6 was released uh, last week, early in the week. Uh, the most notable change to 8.2.6 since 8.2.5 is just that the TLS root certificates list was updated to make sure that it supports servers that use Let's Encrypt certificates, which is used by many, 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 many web servers. So there was a brief regression in 8.2.5 when those certificates didn't work, and we put them back. Um, so uh, feel free to, uh, if you still have trouble uh, connecting to HTTPS sites from CircuitPython, let us know, and we'll look at the root certificates list. But it's been considerably cleaned up in the past few releases. And then uh, finally, uh, for our news items this week, uh, uh, Lady Ada was in, interviewed on the PyCast, which is from Tom's Hardware. It was on September 12th. There's a link to it uh, in the notes doc and in the channel. And um, uh, she, the uh, subject is the following. Writing libraries to support our favorite microcontrollers is a big task. But what if ChatGPT could lend a hand? Adafruit's own Lemur, Lady Ada Freed, has tasked ChatGPT to write Arduino drivers in her own style, creating a mini Lemur bot to handle the task. We sat down with Freed to talk about how AI can help Adafruit and the wider community to write drivers and imp improve workflows. And I'll note, I, I was actually skeptical of this, but it sounds very interesting. And also importantly, uh, 
what Lady Ada does is she uploads stuff to ChatGPT so that it can have more context about what's going on. And it seems to make fewer mistakes that way. OK. And finally, just to talk about where these news items came from, um, they came from the uh, Python for Microcontrollers weekly newsletter, which is uh, emailed every Monday. It's prepared by our own Ann Varela, who's in the chat. And the archives, there's a link to the archives uh, in the notes doc. It highlights the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. We'd love to have you contribute things to the newsletter, either your own stuff or things that you see on social media or on the web or in the news. Uh, you can do that by emailing cpnews at adafruit.com. Uh, you can uh, send us a tweet on uh, Twitter. I won't use the other name. Or you could uh, submit a pull request to the um, GitHub repo. There's a link in the um, notes doc uh, to submit uh, a news item. Any of those things is fine. Okay. So now we'll move on to the uh, next section which is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka, which is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of projects separate from the status updates we'll uh, present later. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, uh, CircuitPython core libraries in Blinka. So first up, overall in the past week, we've had 22 pull requests merged, 17 authors, um, there are some new people, but I think they were uh, mentioned last week, though I don't remember FAST8516 from last week, last week or N3059HF. Um, there were eight reviewers of those 22 pull requests, and there were 36 issues closed by eight people and 15 opened by 14 people, which is a nice improvement on uh, closing open issues. So next up is... Um, discussion of the core, CircuitPython core, and uh, Scott, if you're available, could you read that? Sure, although I am distracted and I will have to find it in the doc here. <laughs> uh, oh, and my fan's on still. Sorry. I was thinking. Um, okay, so for the core, we had 12 pull requests merged from 12 different authors, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, I won't go over new names because I know Dan just did. Uh, we had five reviewers, which is higher than normal for us too. So a uh, special shout out to Blitz City DIY and Tyeth, who have done some reviews for the core this week. Uh, we had 20 open pull requests, which is well under our 25 single page mark, which is great. Um, we do have a number that are quite old, um, although I think the IDF merge that I'm working on is one of those. Uh, so, as always, uh, please take a look if you're uh, involved in any of these old PRs and see if we can close them or update them or what we can do. Uh, Issues-wise for the core, we had five closed issues by three people, seven opened by six people, so we're net up two again, um, and I have a number of folks involved. We have 712 open issues, which is two more than last week, obviously. Uh, not too bad. Uh, we do uh, kind of grow in issues a little bit at, over time. Um, the way that the Adafruit-funded folks prioritize is through uh, milestones. Um, we have 82x, which is stuff we want to get stable pretty quickly. We have nine open issues there. And then we have 53 open issues for 9.0, which is our uh, next major stable version, which is probably months away from being stable. Um, but then we also have long-term, which we have 605 open issues. These are not priority issues for Adafruit-funded folks, but um, if you're interested in, in working on them, we're happy to uh, support you in doing that. And then lastly, we have two issues not assigned to milestones. So those issues um, need to be triaged, and that is a priority for us to do. And that's the state of the core. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next we'll move Thank on you. to Libraries by Foamy Guy. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this section covers the uh, CircuitPython libraries, which is the Python level code, the libraries that interact with drivers and other various uh, helpers and things um, that run on top of CircuitPython. 
Uh, across all of those libraries in the past week, we had four pull requests merged uh, by four authors uh, with two reviewers. Um, in terms of the newer names, I think the uh, two that I don't recognize from before are ADCC and Fast Eddie 516. Uh, so thank you to those folks who might be newer or less frequent, uh, and thanks to uh, everybody else as well who we see more frequently in this list. Um, of the merged pull requests, the oldest one merged this week was 85 days old, and the newest one was just one day old, so we got a, a fresh one in as well. Uh, that is leaving us with 46 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest of those is 396 days, and the newest is two, uh, although I think it does count drafts as well. I believe our oldest ones at this point are down to just drafts. Um, I will echo uh, what Scott mentioned about the PRs in the core. If any of these are yours and you need uh, help or guidance or um, anything like that, definitely feel free to ping uh, me or ask up in the Discord uh, to get help on those. Um, uh, back to the stats for the past week, we had six closed issues. Uh, those were closed by three people, and then we had four new issues opened up by four people. That's uh, leaving 635 issues open overall, and there are 19 of those that are labeled good first issue, uh, which is a great place for folks who uh, don't have much experience but want to get involved in contributing to CircuitPython. If that description matches you, uh, head over to circuitpython.org slash contributing. There's a list of the open PRs and issues there, uh, and I would also encourage you to join us on the Discord here, which is where uh, this meeting occurs. Lots of folks are around there that can help you get uh, involved as well. Um, wrapping it up, we have the PyPy weekly stats. Uh, there were, uh, let's see, what is that? 63,816 PyPy downloads over the 313 libraries. And the top 10 libraries are listed here in the notes doc. I'll let you look at those if you'd like. And there is also a list of the libraries that were updated in the last seven days if anybody wants to check those out. Uh, and that's what we've got for the libraries this week. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now uh, we'll move on to Blinka, uh, read by Maker Melissa. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. This week we had six pull requests merged by one author, which is myself, and four reviewers. There are currently four open pull requests amongst all the repositories, and there were 25 closed issues by five people and four opened by four people, uh, leaving a net of 86 open issues. We had 15,539 PyPI downloads in the last week, uh, 6,047 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 121 boards. So overall, a lot of activity this week uh, in Blake, as I've been working on closing a bunch of issues, and so it's looking really good. All right, thank you. Okay, hold on just a second. All right, and now that we're done with uh, status reports, we'll move on to Hug Reports. So what is Hug Reports? Um, it's a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and we'll go down the list. Um, which is mostly al al alphabetical usually in the notes doc to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or missing the meeting, I'll just read your notes when I get to them in the list. So feel free to submit text only notes if you need to. Okay, so I'll start. So first of all, um, re-upping. Um, uh, we're very sorry to see Katni leave us. Gigantic hugs to Katni for your work on CircuitPython guides and libraries and the community over the past seven year or so years. You shepherded this community to the excellent state it is in today, brought on board many people who are, who are now volunteers or, or are paid to work on CircuitPython or in the community and kept a clear vision of what the community should be. We will miss you greatly. And I remind you, Katni's not, Katni will be participating, I understand, but, uh, She's no longer going to be sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. She's charting her own course for a whole bunch of very interesting things that are coming up. So thank you again. Um, thanks to ADCC for redoing the HID library timeouts. So devices will wait patiently until the host is ready. That's been something that we wanted to do for a long time, but thank you for uh, 
setting that in motion. It was it's really it was really needed. And thanks to Jeff, who I did some pair merging with this morning, and it was really successful. Uh, working on you know relying on his knowledge of a whole bunch of things that I didn't know very much about in the core that uh, yeah, I used his expertise and together we were able to uh, merge three rather recalcitrant files. All right, uh, next up is um, 2231 Puppy, who's text only, who says just a group hug. Okay, and next up is Carter, also text only. Um, Thanks to Foamy Guy for pushing some final code tweaks and merging a semi stalled PR for fixing an EMC 2101 library import issue. Um, thanks to Dan H for some time spent, unfortunately wasted, helping chase a weird Pi Portal issue that ended up just being a bad SD card. And thanks to Katney for all the years of amazing contributions to the CircuitPython community and everything else you helped us with at Adafruit. Happy Trails. Show. Okay. Next up, uh, C. Grover. Thanks to Cadney for preparing to write a new chapter after years of enthusiastically bolstering the CircuitPython community. You set the standard for tireless and empathetic community participation that we can only hope to emulate. I've grown as a contributor largely due to your help and example. Best of luck to you as you turn the page. Thanks to GJ Devon 3 for amazing and somewhat overwhelmingly huge the amazing and somewhat overwhelmingly huge RGB panel project. Besides conquering the mysteries of extending Sir Python to make it work, the 36 ampere power, ampere power supply capacity is getting close to what a welder might need. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, thanks to John Park for the new fundamental SynthIO learning guide. It clearly explains the basics of how to make SynthIO do its thing. The symbolic nomenclature used is perfect for documenting and sharing synthesizer configuration and operation. And thanks to whoever came up with the idea for the Playground Notes section of the Adafruit Learning Guide System. Thank you. I published a few project documents out there to give it a try. All right. Next up, DJ Devon. Uh, thank you, Dan. I have a hug for Maker Melissa for advice on cherry picking matrix portal library layers to avoid unnecessary overhead. A hug to Tanut for an interesting stream on merging ESP IDF into the core. Uh, I've never seen like the ESP IDF stuff that you guys have to deal with, and I'm glad that you deal with it, and I don't have to do anything about it. Uh, a hug to Foamy Guy for great Saturday morning stream on working with HTML templates, and of course, a huge, massive hug to Katni for her last week as a Discord admin, as well as offboarding. You've been absolutely stellar for everything you've done behind the scenes from GitHub to learn guides to all the stuff that nobody sees but is felt. Like your presence is felt more than seen, and I will miss you, and and I will miss fearing you more than Dinobot. Love you. Bye. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, echoing what a lot of folks uh, say, hug report uh, for Cadney. Thanks for all the work you put into the project and the community. Uh, plus all of the help that you've given me uh, when I joined Adafruit and first started getting involved. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Uh, hug report for Michael Pocusa for continued work and coordination on a templating library and a group hug for everybody. Thanks. Okay. And next up is Jeff. Hello. Um, Katni, we'll be seeing you around. Uh, I know you're going to, but keep the channels of communication open with this community and with me personally. You've been a tremendous force for good in this community, and that's even before I account for the fact that probably 90% of what you have done simply goes unnoticed. Well, now we'll notice. Dan, thanks for your work on the merge, and I look forward to being of assistance as I can. And also a second thank you for agreeing to take on extra Discord responsibilities. And I also want to give a big hug report to the MicroPython developers. CircuitPython is a friendly fork of MicroPython. So besides supporting Adafruit through your hardware purchases, you can support MicroPython, for instance, through the GitHub Sponsors feature. Um, and lastly, I have a group hug. All right, thank you. And next up is Katni. All right, this is a big one. <laughs> 
So first up, a group hug to everyone. Uh, this community has been a huge part of what started this chapter in my life, and my involvement with it has been one of the most fulfilling and amazing things I've ever done over the last seven years. I was the source of code plus community equals CircuitPython. Phil showed up on Discord early on asking for help coming up with a tagline for CircuitPython. There were a lot of excellent snake-related ideas, but to me, the thing that drew me to it was the community. I ended up typing up a pretty long message explaining how important the community was to me and how critical it was to my involvement. CircuitPython made coding more approachable to me, but the community is, uh, but the community provided a safe and welcoming place for me to learn more about it. Code plus community equals CircuitPython. I believe this is still a completely valid statement. So thank you for being amazing. Thank you for being a, a part of the welcoming, positive, supportive place that we've created together. And finally, thank you for welcoming me as a community leader and giving me the opportunity to gain the experience of building an open source community. I want to thank the community moderators on Discord. Thank you for being an amazing mod team. This community would not be so safe and welcoming without you. We've built it to the point where we have little to do other than catch spammers, uh, but that was not without an immense amount of work on all of your parts. Um, I appreciate your help and your part in creating what we have. To the Discord helpers, keep being great and don't stop recommending new helpers. Everyone that has been recommended by one of you has eventually accepted and have worked out amazingly well. Thank you for being willing to be more visible in your respective spaces and for all the work you put into this community. Uh, to Dan, Jeff, and Scott, thank you for being a great team to work with and for all your help and support throughout the years. I would not have reached the levels I have without some nudging along the way from each of you. Liz, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have worked directly with you on guides over the last nearly a year. You're fantastic at what you do, and I appreciate all the help you've given me with guide work, especially when I couldn't think of good guide taglines. To Anne, thank you for all your personal support throughout the years. As much as the newsletter is a huge undertaking, I'm glad that I was asked to take it over so you could have time away when you needed to because it gave us the opportunity to work together. And thank you for picking up the blogs that I miss on a regular basis. I really do hate WordPress. Carter, thanks for being always being willing to dive into a schematic with me or explain some fundamental electronics concept that I missed due to my learning path to get where I am. You always take the time to explain everything from the ground up and I've learned so much from you. Melissa, I'm really glad I had the opportunity to meet you in person multiple times. I greatly appreciate your insight on things and all the help you've given me with questions related to things in your wheelhouse. I look forward to you getting back to creating personal projects and posting videos. To Tectric, for always being available to jump into CI issues, being willing to break things, and being perfectly happy to fix them. It's been great to work with you and I appreciate all the CI and library help. To Tim, thank you for always being up for helping out with pretty much everything I've come up with in the libraries, etc. Especially thank you for all the help with the personal projects and ideas, such as my fantastic PyCon Pi badge this year, where folks could interact with it over wireless to change the LED colors and play a snake game. It was everything I was hoping for, and it really gave people an opportunity to um, interact with CircuitPython without actually having to do anything with it themselves. To Bruce, thank you for a million things, but especially for being so helpful with wording things. Your help with the community code of conduct has been invaluable. It's always been useful to be able to bounce things off you as you almost always have a better way to say it. Thank you to everyone that I've met throughout the years, whether online or in person, and to everyone who supported me in so many ways, including reading my guides, helping me with code and bugs, letting me know when something I suggested worked out, and so much more. One of the most amazing things has been you telling me your stories of how something I created or helped create had a positive impact on you or folks you know. I will still be a part of this community, albeit in a different capacity. Please don't stop sharing your stories with those who have, a sort, who have that sort of impact on you. It can end up meaning more than you know. And to anyone I miss, know that you have not gone unnoticed. My brain can only process so much at once, and this was already a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Kathy, and I would say a, a group you're welcome, you're most welcome for everybody you've mentioned. And we'll move on to Maker Melissa. Um, I have a head for Kathy. I'm glad I was able to get to know you and wanted to thank you for encouraging me to try out uh, some live streaming on Circuit Python Day, both last year and this year. I'm also glad about the opportunities that we've had to work together on various things, including attending PyCon together. And also, I'm um, glad we will be able to keep in touch and group by everyone else. All right. Uh, next, Mark Ambler. Um, 
thank you, Katni, for pushing and helping me to get involved as a reviewer, which led to my eventual contributions to libraries and then the core, for proactively reaching out to ensure roadblocks were removed, and for your countless guides I rely on weekly to help me with my own projects. I hope you still drop by the community from time to time to say hi. Uh, next is, I'll read Mikhail Pakusas. Uh, thanks, Foamy Guy, for helping with test help with testing the template engine, Saturday stream, and Sunday pair programming session. Uh, next is Paul Cutler. Thanks, Katni, for everything you've done for this community. I can't wait to see what you do next. And next up is Scott. Uh, Katni, thank you again. Uh, yeah, you, it's hard to imagine Circuit Python without you, and I'm, I'm working on it. Um, Circuit Python and the community surrounding it wouldn't be what it is today without you. Uh, I, everyone, everything that everybody has said is true, but I also wanted to highlight that you've managed the libraries, <laughs> the libraries for Circuit Python, and you've done a great job doing that. And uh, it's a core reason that folks uh, come to Circuit Python. So thank you for that. And uh, I too am excited to see what you do next. Uh, and then also, I, I got to give MicroDev a shout out as well, because I just I, I just made the PR for the IDF 5.0 merge, and MicroDev did the vast majority of the hard work of that, so thanks to them. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, we'll move on to status updates. Uh, status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and I'll go through the list. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you plan to be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to the in the weed section. So as I start, um, as I mentioned, I released CircuitPython 826 last week to add, just to add a certificate for Let's Encrypt. And there are a couple of other minor fixes. So that worked. And uh, we don't have anything really imminent for 827, but I'm sure there will be an 827. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're, uh, we're working, I worked a lot more on the MicroPython v1.20.0 merge. Uh, I pruned down hundreds of merge files, merge conflicts to about eight files. And then uh, I was kind of stuck on those. So Jeff and I did pair merging this morning uh, to go over some things that he has a lot more knowledge about. We did three of those files and we'll continue in that same vein for the uh, remaining files later today or tomorrow. And so once these merges are done, I can finally do the first commit of the merge and stop saving things by hand because you, when you're doing a merge, you have to finish it before you commit, unfortunately. And uh, we'll start trying builds. And then I probably will also make a second pass through the changes, which was helpful last time to catch some rough edges. All right, next up, I will read uh, 2231 Puppies. Got KiCad running on Android. And there's a link there for that in the notes about how it works uh, in, in, uh, Ki in Puppies um, blog. Oh, and it's in, the, it's in the channel too, great. Okay, continuing working on the eFidget. It's almost time for version six. All right, next up is C Grover. Uh, I'll read that. Release the code for the Windless IoT Weather Chimes project. A summary is available here. There's a link. Built a few Matrix Portal Twister Adapter PCDs from Oshpark, of course. The PCBs allow a Matrix Portal board to be turned 180 degrees, so it will be completely contained within the RGB pa display panel's shadow rather than sticking out on one end. Essential for mounting the panel in a picture frame. That sounds very interesting and maybe it's going to be something that we have in the store. Okay. We built the re remaining physical patio wind chimes using 132nd stainless steel cable and crimp ferrules rather than nylon fishing leader. Didn't realize there was a system of cable and ferrules of that size out there. I've been living under a rock. And there's a link for that too in the notes. Okay. Next up is DJ Devin. Oh, thank you. Uh, last week, I went from four matrix panels to nine driven by the Matrix Portal S3. Uh, I fixed a driver with OpenAI, taking the lead from Lady Ada on her OpenAI AI session, uh, to read a, an ST7796S display to refresh in landscape mode. 
Uh, I went on show and tell last week with 12 matrix panels that were jumbled out of order uh, as a surprise progress update. Unfortunately, it did not work due to the incorrect ordering. Uh, this week, I figured out why the 12 panels were out of order. The RGB matrix is extremely particular. Oop, hold on. Ugh. About the first panel placement in the serpentine order. I'm extremely happy with 12 panels. I might attempt to add more for science because I have not hit the limit yet. Uh, created a quick graphic for someone on Discord to easily differentiate between a Cutie Pie ESP32 S3 with 8 megabytes of flash, no PS RAM, versus 4 megabytes of flash, 2 P PS RAM. They are visually identical, except for the model printed on the ESP32 chip that you need a magnifying glass to read. Uh, Liz asked to use the graphics in the Cutie Pie S3 Learn Guide, so I cleaned up the image a little bit for better illustration. And credit goes to Toddbot for spotting the differences. I only made the graphic for it. There, there's that. And then I finished 3D printing 26 brackets for the 12-panel LED matrix uh, that will be going on show until this week uh, with a working 12-panel demo. The only difference in the code between four panels versus 12 panels is height, width, and column count. And that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thank you, Dan. Last week, I continued working with uh, Michael Pocusa on some on the uh, templating library uh, that we have been working on. Um, got a lot of great progress on that. It's getting to the point where it's about ready for publishing. Have a note in the weeds to discuss that a bit further. A um, couple other things that I was doing some testing on last week. There was a Ethernet, uh, WizNet PR, so I got that uh, Featherwing back out and ran through all the tests on that to try it out. Uh, um, before that, uh, last week, like last Monday, I was working on the patch for the docs uh, theme fix and getting that ready to go, test it out and uh, submitted into Adabot. Um, and then over the weekend, I uh, tried out the new TFT shield uh, on the Metro S3. I was uh, particularly interested in trying to get the SD card to see if I could uh, work with that since it's a separate SD card from the one that's on the Metro. Uh, I did not have luck, but uh, I do have a Metro S2 that I can use for uh, the same thing I have in mind, so I, I can still kind of continue on with that. It's no biggie. Um, this week uh, is, if nobody has uh, any concerns on that RTD uh, patch fix, then I'm going to get the Adab uh, Adabot PR merged and run that today, uh, later on, or, or uh, later on this week, if uh, anybody else wants to take another uh, look or if any concerns come out. And then uh, the uh, new PR that I have lined up to take a, a look at this week, which I just got some hardware for as well, is the ADT7410, which is a temperature sensor. And um, there's a PR in that makes many improvements and uh, rewrites the library to use register uh, class. So that's what I'll be taking a look at next. Thanks. All right. Thank you. OK. And Jeff is up next. Hello. So uh, last week, I wrote the Bitbang SPI over IceGrid C bus expander. The pull request is green, and I'm, uh, at least as of earlier, was waiting for a re-review on that. So hopefully that will go in soon. And with that pull request, the uh, Espressif ESP32 S3 LCD EV development board now boots to the display, um, which is pretty cool. Um, even coded in C, it takes a fair bit of time to send the initialization code. Based on an internal discussion, um, that boot time initialization is now happening with the I2C bus at 400 kilohertz instead of 100 kilohertz, so it takes um, about a second and a quarter. Uh, the other thing that I did last week was some small improvements to the RGB matrix documentation in Read the Docs. The air quality here is pretty lousy right now, so bear with me as I uh, clear my throat. Uh, anyway, this week, I've got uh, those two PRs to get to completion. I'm starting to help out Dan with the merge, as he uh, told you about, and I'll be doing a lot more once he is able to commit and push some code. Then we can kind of divvy up the errors or whatever it is we're grappling with. And um, I'm a bit late to the party, as the guide was published last week, but I will be reading through that Synthio guide um, to A, learn things, and B, to see if I have any feedback to give 
but I think it's probably pretty much a perfect guide. And anyway, coming up soon, I'm going to be out starting on October 4, and then my day back to work will be November 13. And in the note stock, there is a list of a number of cities where my vacation will take me. It's in uh, Spain and Portugal. If you wanted to meet me, show me around, or just get a cup of coffee, you can uh, talk to me here on Discord, and I would be more than happy to see if that would work out. And that's what I've got. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Kathy for status report. All right, so last week I put the uh, Metro M7 SD guide into moderation. Uh, it has been moderated. I um, haven't had a chance yet to look at uh, what needs to be fixed up, but uh, that'll be good to go and that'll be published this week, I'm sure. Um, otherwise, this week, uh, as any fixes found in the guide, um, wrapping everything up and offboarding. My final day contracting with Adafruit is Friday, September 22nd, which is this Friday. And. Um, so it's just sort of wrapping up loose ends and uh, getting info to people who want it and so on and so forth. That's what I've got. All right. Thank you. All right. And Maker Melissa is now up next. Uh, so last week I worked on GitHub issues with a focus on the Blinker related ones. Um, and I updated the RA8875 learn guide. And this week I'm going to continue going through and paring down other GitHub issues. Okay. And finally, last but not least, Scott is uh, up for the last status report. All right. Um, so for me, uh, I said the 500 is pretty much ready for review or for PR. Um, I just merged it in. So, uh, or I, I merged in the IDF changes that I was needing for the IDF 5 merge PR. So I just made the PR. It's 8411, I think. Uh, on Friday on my stream, I started the 5.1 merge. It doesn't look too bad. It looks pretty minor, uh, but I will do that up as a follow follow on PR still. Uh, if I remember right on Friday, I got the S3 working, but I also wanted to add the C6 and the H2 as well. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, fully in IDF land. And then if I manage to get out of that by the end of the week, I will also uh, be doing some enhancements to the web workflow stuff. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next. That's it, right? Okay. Yeah. I just got spaced out. Um, next up is in the weeds. Um, this is a section for uh, long form discussions that come out of status updates or that people identify ahead of time. So if you have any in the weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things. So we're not waiting around to see, uh, if you have something and you can just type up some background. So we've got two things today or more th more than that today. Three things. So this will go uh, longer than usual. Um, so first, uh, 2231 puppy uh, says, I love Mu, but it's pretty beginner oriented. I'd love to see it officially endorse VS Code or other code or editor extension for Circuit Python that's a little more capable. The existing one is a little buggy and doesn't have official backing from Adafruit. I'm sure full support for VS Code, as in helping people with it, is too much to ask. But having a CircuitPython editor set up for more advanced users would be much appreciated. So um, I'll just make a couple of remarks here. Uh, we don't even support Mu officially uh, because obviously like maintaining one of these things is a noticeable amount of work. So we recommend Mu, but we don't. It's not uh, officially supported by Adafruit. Um, uh, besides VS Code, there's also PyCharm. I don't know if there's a separate plugin, but it works pretty well. And if anybody else has comments, uh, please go ahead and say them. And if anybody would like to work on an extension to any editor, that would be great. So you might check out PyCharm, I guess is what to say. I think I think the challenge is that the those of us that are more advanced all use different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I know. I don't, it, I don't right, have a good it, it comes down to personal preference or, or tradition. Yeah, and like I don't, I, I, I have no love for VS Code, so <laughs> that's part of it as well. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, twenty-two thirty-one, Papa, you're Misha in the in the chat. Is that right? That's right. It looks like I see a pup. I think it's Micah. Micah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Next up is uh, Jeff, who is interested in talking about I two C bus locking. Yeah. So the question for my lightning talk is: What if we abolish I squared C bus locking? Um, and I'm thinking about this because it seems to be the largest problem with the idea of I squared C bus expanders uh, working kind of generally like digital IOs with uh, background things like keypad. Um, spy bus locking makes sense. There are two reasons that we need to do it. One, um, you have to manipulate, you have to use the spy bus and manipulate the chip select pins and each device on a spy bus can have a different frequency because when a device is chip select is not selected, the device just doesn't even monitor the rest of the bus. On the other hand, the I2C bus, there is no chip select pin and there's no settable frequency. All of the devices on the bus have to work at the frequency um, that is selected. Although we had an internal discussion about this and that turns out not to be exactly true, but bear with me and just pretend that's true. Um, so I looked at our implementations um, because another thing is, um, can a I squared C transaction be interrupted for the background tasks? Um, and this can only occur in the STM and Broadcom ports. Um, so preempting long I squared C transactions has not been seen as necessary. We would have to remove those uh, calls and replace them with just busy waiting uh, because otherwise it would be possible for uh, for instance, a display I.O. update to an I squared C display to start happening in the background during a foreground I squared C transaction if we change that. Um, a possible historical reason that this existed is originally we didn't have the function write then read into or we didn't consistently use it. Um, and in order to get the repeated start transaction, the locking would have been required so that nothing else could grab the I squared C bus between the write and the subsequent read that has to be done under the repeated start condition. Uh, if we decided to do this, then the try lock and unlock functions can remain in the core during a transitional period and they would simply not do anything. Try lock would always say, yes, I succeeded, and unlock would always do nothing. Um, so anyway, that is the brain dump of what's on my mind. That's the why we uh, should do it. That's the why um, it looks like it would be a minor change and that's what's on my mind thank you okay so and i added i, I was wondering if we ever added threads would we um would we get into a state in which uh, something like a, a a write a write then read into would be interrupted in the middle for instance that would that, that would be what i worried about also if we implement some kind of async um support Async I/O support for I2C. I don't know. I didn't write that down, but that's another possibility. Another question is whether, in the case of preemptive multitasking, whether there could be there could be in, internal invisible locking if the size of a transaction is only one of these function calls. If the size of a transaction is longer, like if there's a sort of a semantic transaction in which you have to have control of the whole thing for longer, uh, then you need kind of external locking. But if it's always the case that the locking is 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 internal to one function call, then we could do, do internal locking, and that would solve the problem of some other things. Uh, right, and that, um, I think, it speaks a little bit to what Deshapu said in text. Yeah. Uh, he writes, we still need I2C locking because there are I2C based displays that are being used in the background. Um, but if, for instance, when you call into the I2C write function, um, that can only go into refreshing the display if there is a run background tasks call there. Um, so by saying that those should be removed in the two ports where they are, the STM and the Broadcom, that would mean it was no longer possible for the background task to interrupt. Um, 
but there could be other future forms of concurrency, such as uh, hypothetical multi-core or threading, and those would have to put some kind of lock around the just the write function or the read into function because they can't all access like the microcontroller registers that control the I squared C bus. They would have to wait for the previous in progress operation to finish. Mm -hmm. And that would be some kind of locking, but I think it could be at the function level, not an explicit lock that's taken in your CircuitPython code. Right. Now, have, have you looked at what, does MicroPython do any locking? Like in terms that would be a good thing to look at. I haven't. I, I suspect they don't, but I, I don't, don't know. I don't think they do. They do? I don't think they, I don't think they, they do. Yeah, I don't think they do. Also, can you, Scott, can you say anything about, was it, was it Tony who originally came up with this, or was it you to have? It was me. Okay. And I think, so I think just right pointing to the like write then read into was two calls originally. Mm -hmm. And it was like Linux that forced us into one call. Um, I'll tell you, I'm really scared of removing it only to find that we do need it. <laughs> Cause like the other, the other thing that, the other thing to t take into account is like the reason, one of the reasons we added it is that we knew we were going to build code on top of it. And so if we're now we're like, not only are we talking about like at least stubbing it out in this API, but potentially removing it from all the code built on top, the moment you like, I'm scared of doing that because I think we could find out that we need it. Right. And we already have this code that does it. I think, uh, Jeff, I think it would help to be more explicit about what you're trying to prevent. Uh, like, I, I think there's one more level that we need to talk about why you want to do this. And I think it might be that by having these APIs, we risk people miss locking, right? So like in a world where you, where you, where you can lock it, there's possible abilities that user code locks it for too long. Um, or they think, simply never unlock it. Um, you know, when you don't right. use a uh, bus, bus device I2C, you could write a try lock and then have an exception, including hitting control C, and you right. end up with the, the bus locked and a variety of bad things happen then. The lock doesn't get unset by reset? I think it does by reset. Right. I guess I, I think it's okay for these internal uses like IO expanders to not work in the case that lock like mislocking happens. I'm yeah. I'm not convinced that it's worth removing all of this locking because of this case. Like like spy when when I, like this is something display IO has to worry about because it takes that lock for the display and it just doesn't update, right? Like it doesn't crash, it just doesn't update if if it can't get the lock and I don't see why that can't be the case for for other uses like IO expanders. Uh, well, so suppose that you've got um, a keypad.keys and some of the pins are IO expanders. Um, right. I guess the keypad.keys would have to first check every pin that it's going to talk to and say, are you an IO expander on a locked bus? And if all of them say, no, I'm not an IO expander on a locked bus, then it would be okay to scan the keyboard. Right. And, and that feels, that gets a long ways away from, we could just pass in a different kind of object and have keypad.keys work. We would have to go through well, and explicitly that, in every place make these but, new checks. But you're assuming that you're assuming that it has to do a lock check. Whereas if if you were if you were passing it in a generic Python object, you would have to handle exceptions. And if you're ha handling exceptions uh, generally, then you then like the underlying code could also do the lock check and raise an exception to you. And then your outer code is generic uh, in exception handling. So I think, yeah, I guess. Right, and and this is something I want to have. We need to talk about the Bitbang stuff as well for the same reason. Like, if we move to a world where, like, your Bitbang IO takes in digital in out like things, then there's no reason to have this other code because we already had Bitbang IO um, that could do these sort of weirdo abstractions of like 
I have a pin over I squared C, and now I want a bitbang spy. Like, you could, you could create a bitbang IO spy with, with the digital inouts that use I squared C under the hood, and, and achieve the same thing. Yes, although it would probably be, probably be slower. It would probably do additional I squared C bus transactions. Um, but it's true. I, I don't it could, know if you, it could do it. And and you know if you're alluding to the fact that you could like maybe I haven't looked at detail, but maybe you're setting two pins at once, right? Like yes, maybe maybe that's the optimization we would need to worry about because you know that's something that's an optimization I think people would like from Python as well, like a, a multi-pin digital in-out sort of thing is something that I could see people wanting, and then maybe that's the right abstraction instead. Um, yeah, this. So, I mean, if hypothetically we, there's this PR that you're alluding to that is an open PR right now, and that's like, just give the minimum functionality we need to enable these displays, um, and you know, not spend five seconds or ten seconds initializing them because we have a loop coded in Python, um, but spend the least amount of time because it is kind of lengthy. It adds over a second to the initialization time when you do it as fast as possible. Um, if we did IO expanders later, the implementation of that function would become much simpler. You just delete it all and turn it into a, into use of Bitbang IO. So that would get right. simpler, and then we could drop the this function in CircuitPython 10 or 11 or whatever. Sure, sure. sure. Um, but I'm trying to get trying to figure out: can we get to where there there's like f few caveats around IO expanders because. I feel like caveats like reading a digital pin might throw an exception now. I feel like that is not going to be super usable and will just end up irritating people. I wouldn't like that. <laughs> it's the, is kind of what I'm feeling. So maybe we should maybe we need to like have a separate meeting or or discuss this in an issue or something. I one thing also that is you you you're talking about IO expanders in particular, but it's also true that people often don't understand how to use the locks. And Adafruit bus device, you give it a low level object and then it wraps it in a higher level object. And mm. I'm just wondering whether we might have a constructor on Adafruit bus device or convenience functions that do that so you would never see the locking. For instance, the fact that the scan operation is on the lower level object, like why? <laughs> you know, it, 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 I always, Every every two or three weeks, somebody says, "Why? Why do right. they forget to call try lock before doing scan?" Right. And that's just, it's like, why should they shouldn't really see that object most of the time? Yeah, that was a problem I had early. I remember yeah. exactly what that was like and how it was kind of like, "Oh, this is this is really fiddly. I'm not sure how I feel about this." Right. It was like it should be like underscore I two C or something, and 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 every bus device should actually take care of that management. I mean, you might have to tell it, oh, this is a bit buying I O object or this is a bus I O object, and you want to use board. You know, you you usually want to have the bus, but on the other hand, you don't want to use the bus except through a free bus device. So, I don't know. Right. What to say. Yeah. The other thing about having a discussion about this is it would be good to bring uh, GitHub user Zodius Infuser into this because right. uh, they are working on uh, code to support a upcoming Pimeroni board. And right. they have probably thought about this and thought of things that we haven't. And so I don't know if we have lines of communication open with them to try and like get a video chat or something, but it might be worth doing. I also... I can, yeah, I mean, I can arrange that. I think they're in the UK, so it's just mostly time. Uh, Deshi Poo is also saying very Deshi. important things. I think, in oh, I haven't been paying attention to the text. Yeah, like, let's let's read that. Yeah, like he says, treating I pins on I/O expanders as regular GPO pins is a huge can of worms. And um, I think people won't understand why it's slow. That's yeah. That's right. I mean, so this this sort of idea of we've also had a a discussion which may be unrelated to this about. Uh, the fact that like digital in out encompasses both pin naming and also pin state, like whether or not there's a pull up and things like that, and so this whole thing might be perhaps ought to be rethought in some way. But I don't know what, exactly what that is. 
So, I mean, you're alluding to the pad idea, right? The pad idea, right? Which it's is, not it's not naming because we have a pin object which is separate from just right. But now. if you look at so if you look at MicroPython, MicroPython uses numbers or, and now occasionally strings for pin names. Right. Okay. Right. But the pin object is actually a pad, in 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 our in, in, in the way you describe pad. So. Maybe that whole thing needs to get rethought in some way, and maybe there's some higher level abstraction that would, that would that would work for all of this. Yeah. But I mean, that's what we're di that's what we're discussing in in um, in the issue around drive strength. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly, right. But I don't I don't I don't think that applies to this IO expander idea because. Um, like an IO expander really just has one kind of peripheral that's connected to the pin. So I think the right abstraction for that is the digital in out, if not. And, and yeah. But then, then again, it does have dry strength and things too. So, I mean, I think the short term conclusion, maybe I'm wrong, Jeff, you say like, well, maybe we have to, it isn't just as simple as dropping it. So. Um, yeah, I can accept that. Yeah. It was yeah. just. I, I felt like the argument could be made, but I appreciate that we shouldn't just uh, willy-nilly throw away these protections that we have um, against the access. And yeah, it puts me back to we're doing the right thing right now by um, creating the one higher performance thing we need for one purpose. And we need to understand more before we try to create a generic IO expander that works with objects in the core like keypad. Because, uh, of course, we do have objects that implement the digital I.O. like um, in a duct typing way that we have for Seesaw or whatever. And those work fine, but you just can't pass them to these kinds of functions like keypad. Or Bitbang I.O. And I think that's what I'm getting at. Is like we already have Python libraries that implement digital in-out like things. And maybe we need to make like native Bitbang I.O. work with those things. Like it could do the... The Python dictionary lookup of like what what is my function that I'm calling to do this set or whatever, right? It could optimize that out once and still run the like clock set data loop in in C and it'd be faster than the Python version. Yeah, and I think we did something like that with the core implementation of uh, bus device, where it does work with a uh, with any kind of object as long right. as it has those method names. Right. Um, it may be a little bit different because value is a property rather than a um, function call, but that's, I don't know what that exactly ends up looking like. Yeah, that's true. I don't know if the, the I think you might have to set it through the lookup mechanism, unfortunately, but there is caching on my, the, under, under the hood that would probably mean that it, it's not too expensive to look it up at a second time. Um, I, I agree with you. Jeff, that like we'll just do this one method to do it fast at the start, and then we can worry about it later. And and like you said, we can re-implement it differently, and then take it out if need be. All right. So I, I I agree with that. So I'll get back to you on the PR. All right. It it feels in a way like we're going around in a circle, but it's really helpful to just reinforce that uh, what we're doing right now is probably the smart thing, and grabbing some big uh, big elusive goal is not the thing to do right now. So thanks to all of you. Okay. And it, that's is, all I need. it is worth thinking about because it's possible that we we could decide on something for 9.0 because we're not imminently like switching what I think of between alpha and beta where like once we're in beta we don't really want to change you know like we don't want to break any APIs when we're in beta it's more about like edit, adding any other features and then when we're bug hunting it's release candidate so we do have a little time if we do want to try to get 9.0 but it feels like you know, one of those ideas where it's really going to take, you know, till CircuitPython 10 to, to decide how we want to, how we want to evolve things. All right. Well, I think we should, this, we've said about 20 minutes on this, so we probably should move on to um, the next in the weeds, especially since we have so many. But thanks for bringing this up. And I think it, it's caused provoking stuff. Okay, I will, I will move on to uh, Mikhail Pokus's, um next one, is, which is about the templating engine library, and I'll read it since it's text only. 
Some time ago, Foaming Guy did try implementing uTemplate library to work with CircuitPython and the Adafruit HTTP server library. Due to the Adafruit, to the, due to the API exposed by the uTemplate, the whole process required some not so obvious steps and some boilerplate code in order to make it work. Over the last two weekends, me and Foamy Guy have worked on the prototype of a Django-like templating engine with a more intuitive API. There are plans for creating examples in HTTP server that show its uses with the templates. In the current state, it seems like it is ready to be released as v1.0.0. The main question is, is it possible to release it as Adafruit template engine as part of the main bundle? It is closely related to Adafruit HTTP server, but could also be used independently. That is why for now it was not added as another module HTTP server. Main reason for this is purely the repository owner aspect as in other bundles, if I'm correct, I would be the owner thus requiring me to adapt to the docs generation methods and keeping the actions up to date, etc. If the main bundle is not the correct place, should it be added to the community bundle or the CircuitPython bundle? Foamy Guy suggested adding Adafruit as collaborator to my repo, which would allow others than me to publish changes without me accepting the PR. From the two, community bundle seems like a better choice. I would say, for instance, the uh, CSV module presents the bundle, present, present in the bundle offers a somewhat similar set of functionalities, meaning they could be used in multiple scenarios and is not directly connected with a specific board, sensor, etc. Regardless of the bundle that it should go to, the second question is, what should be the next step for releasing it? And then he links to the um, CircuitPython library uh, guide. So I would just say, uh, so uh, foamy guy, uh, as, are like a library that is in Adafruit is supported by Adafruit, which means that somebody who gets paid by Adafruit will work on it, and we're willing to work on it indefinitely. That's really the main criterion about whether it's an Adafruit or something else. Um, so if, for instance, foamy guy, you felt that. Yes, you're willing to maintain. If you're willing to respond to bug reports about this, if McCall is not available, then it could it could be a an Adafruit um, an Adafruit library. Like I was very happy, for instance, I wrote the original Adafruit HTTP server library, which is completely different than it was, and I was really happy for community members to take it over. But I'm still ultimately responsible for fixing bugs, or Adafruit is, not me in particular. So, yeah. so does that sound like um, it seems like a useful enough thing that maybe it should go in? But it means by we write also guide, write a guide about it, but it means we have to support it. That's what it really means. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, personally, I'm I'm definitely up for helping support it either either way, no matter where it lands. Truthfully. Um, I just didn't know Mikhail had asked me about this, and I didn't know I wanted to to bring it up here and get get thoughts from everybody. Sure. Um, and we didn't want to add it to like it, initially, at least, at least in my mind, initially there there was the thought to add this functionality to HTTP server library because that's my kind of intended use case for it. Um, but the the more we started thinking about it and actually getting some of it done, it made made sense I think to keep it separate because there are potentially a few use cases that are outside of that. It's it's the main thing that I want to use it for, but you could also use it for generating um, like XML, for instance, is something we don't have another library for, and this could help you with. So um, I think there are a couple other uses. And we always and try so to chop libraries to... up so they're as small as possible. So that yeah. we don't use a memory. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I am totally uh, totally up up for... for um, you know, supporting it in in whatever capacity is is needed ongoing, um, but that's definitely something that stands any which way, no matter where it lands, really. So, uh, if if there is um, interest, or or if it seems like something that there could be other interest in to make a guide, like you said, or any other projects around, uh, I'm up for supporting it in under the Adafruit uh, bundle. But uh, if it makes more sense in the community bundle or the circuit python bundle even since there are a couple of us uh, so far that are working on it um one of the other things that i had thrown out as an idea which i'm interested to get thoughts on as well so there are groups on uh github like the librarians for instance circuit python librarians 
Uh, are there any instances of, or are there any thoughts around, like, um, and, and is it even possible, I'm not sure, like sharing community repos with that group? I think maybe one thing that some potential library owners might feel is like not necessarily wanting to be on the hook for that ongoing support if they had a group where they could give access to that group and if that group is willing to um, they could then have access to do reviews and stuff like that. I don't know if it's technologically possible um, but if it is uh, I wonder if that's something that is encouraged for members of the community or if it's not not so much um, for them to try to like add the a group or organization or whatever that is as a um well, we kind of like add, allowed. We add people as outside collaborators and they have privileges. We can give them privileges to do things. So um, it's okay. Well, I think all of the ways for yeah. I think all of the ways for doing that involve transferring the repository from an individual to some organization, whether that's the Adafruit organization or the CircuitPython organization. I don't think you can add name groups of people to a repository that is in a GitHub user. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I know we could share user to user, I knew, and then I knew uh, I can like mention CircuitPython librarians. I don't know exactly how that group exists, yeah. but I wondered if that could be shared I mean, too, but it's like you, maybe not. Do you want to recreate this? Does it make sense to re-cookie cutter this library? Um, yeah, definitely. Over. The yeah, the code we have now is just uh, bare, it do, it doesn't have the cookie cutter stuff in it at all. So I think either way, it will be good to cookie cut that and get like README and all the other boilerplate right. and so stuff that comes do, along with if that. If you do that, we'll make it an official Adafruit library, and we can add Michal as a as a collaborator. Okay, cool. Yep, I can do that, and then. Um, I did. I added that link at the bottom. the The second question that uh, McCall had put in there was about what What are the next steps? And I can I can help uh, work with them on that as well. I added that link to there, but it's cookie cut, and then it's um, once the library is created and released, it'll be create a PR in the bundle uh, in the bundle repo. Um, so I'll work on. I'll work on that with them. We'll get it cookie cutted, and then once that new library is set up. Um, or I think I don't have the rights to create it. We'll, we'll work on creating the repo, and then I'll need help from somebody to create it inside GitHub, and then we'll check in the initial code to it. Sure. No problem. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. I think that we, we can progress on that. Okay, I think that wraps it up for... Um, for in the weeds, we had a we had a lot of lawn mowing today in the, in the weeds. So, uh, that but that's great. It means that we have interesting things to, to work on. So I'll finish up. I'll I'll wrap up here. This has been over an hour, which is unusual. It's been a while since they've run this long. Uh, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for Monday, September eighteenth, twenty twenty three. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, and those of us that work on Circuit Python, consider purchasing from the Adafruit Shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. And our next meeting will be uh, next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern and 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific time. Uh, you can join the meeting by going to adafru.it slash discord, and if you want to be notified, ask to be added to the at sign CircuitPythonistas role in Discord. So we hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everyone, for a great meeting. I appreciate it. And I will stop recording.